Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. And again, I'm Jason Trenner. This is Nick Bonesack. Um, with another partner, Don Rissmiller, we uh, founded uh, Strategus 10 years ago. We just had our 10th anniversary party here uh, about a month ago. And so we love this place. And uh, we love it for a variety of reasons, not just uh, aesthetically, it's a beautiful place to be, but also we actually believe that finance. Uh, is a very important part, has very kind of strong social uh, aspect to it, and that there wouldn't be America without finance. So, we, you know, we've spent a lot of time on that, and uh, so I, I echo uh, David's comments. So, one of the, um, you might have heard one of the principles that we have, research principles, is humility. And uh, that's, uh, we're, I'm always reminded, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith said there's two types of economists there, there's those that don't know, and those that don't know they don't know. And we're very much, uh, we have some clients here, and we're very much focused on trying to get to the right answer. And so we, we don't want to, I'll just give you a, a disclaimer, we're not trying to offend anybody politically or anything along those lines. We're market people, we're just trying to get to the right answer. And so Nick and I are going to ham and egg it here a little bit. We, I, it's hard to be a fireside chat when you work with somebody day by day. I mean, it's because I know all the things he's going to say. And For 20 years. A few, to few topics that we're going to discuss. Uh, but Nick, why don't we get started, sure. and, and why don't you discuss really, uh, as the uh, flyer says, what, what we're finding when we talk to clients as far as investor sentiment and what some of our proprietary measures show. Yeah, and, and, and thank you very much all for, for joining us. I, election season is an interesting time uh, at our shop. We spend three years and a half <clears throat> focused on, on the markets and, and more fundamental fare uh, and economics and all those sorts of things. And then just silly season happens. Uh, sometimes around, sometime around the convention, and of course, it, it seems this election is silly season has been going on for probably three or four times longer than that uh, since last uh, since last fall. And when we travel around, people start to lose a little bit of interest in the markets and uh, really start to ramp up the intensity of focus on on the election and what that implies and what that means and and, and how we should think about that. Uh, I'm struck sort of every day in the you know, mainstream print media, they have the probabilities of Secretary Clinton's victory potentially and, and Mr. Trump's. And it's some place between 90 and 10 in her favor or 80 and 20 in her favor. Um, when we go on the road, we actually find it, uh, when we take a survey of clients at a table for luncheon or something like that, we get similar results, skewed probably more towards the 80-20. But when we look at some of the portfolios that we've constructed, and we do this every two years and, and certainly every four, to construct portfolios of companies that should do well uh, if Republicans win or should do well uh, if Democrats win, uh, that's showing a little bit of a tighter race. It's, it's certainly showing it's still very much in her camp, but probably scoring at 55 or 60 percent uh, as opposed to 80 or 90 percent. And so from that vantage point, uh, it's probably a much tighter race. Uh, than you would get just by watching sort of cable news uh, in, in the evening, uh, particularly the politically biased cable news uh, stations. And I think that's very, very important because it's going to have some, uh, some very real implications in terms of, um, you know, the days that will follow the election and the days that will run up to, to forming a government. Um, our Democratic suite portfolio uh, is outperforming the S&P this year. So in a year where it's been difficult to find returns, our Democratic portfolio is, uh, is outperforming by 100 basis points. Conversely, our Republican portfolio uh, is underperforming by about 160 basis points. And to uh, sort of put those together, that suggests that the race is more of a 55-45, which may well be where the, the, the election ends up, but certainly tighter than I think a lot of the, the media would, you know, would probably have you guess at. Um, I'll share a, a, a very sort of brief story and, and, and then ask Jason to, to comment on the, the phenomena that is Donald Trump. Uh, before we talk about the phenomena that is Secretary Clinton, I suppose. Uh, about a year ago, we uh, hosted a conference. Uh, it's sort of the more intimate of the three conferences that we host. It was down in Bermuda, uh, so it's fortunate from that vantage point. But we invite uh, clients and their spouses, and there's about 20 of them, and it's a three or four day in forum uh, where we exchange a lot of ideas and talk about a lot of, a lot of different topics, some of them very acutely financial, some of them uh, more broad. And we invited two guest speakers to join us uh, for a couple of hours. One was uh, the political strategist Carl Rove, and the other one was the political strategist James Carville. And um, as luck would have it, Speaker Boehner had resigned that morning, so it was a fairly lively conversation. And towards the end of the question and answer, 
uh, one of our clients said, uh, Mr. Rove, what do, you, what do you peg Mr. Trump's chances uh, of becoming the Republican nominee? He was one of, uh, at the time, 15 declared nominees. He said, 0.0. .0. And around the room, the Strategians, we sort of chuckled a little bit about that. And I, I asked Jason to just sort of comment on this. Uh, Jason wrote a, a, an article, an, a, an essay, for our clients back in August of last year that said, if Trump is a stock, he's under-owned. And so, Jason, I was wondering if you could just sort of tell us a little bit about what, what you were picking up and why you felt that was the case, and how does that translate today, call it 15, 16 months later, where he's the Republican nominee? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I've had plenty of bad calls, too. That was a good call. Um, I, I think part of it, I, I do think that one of the, as an investor, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about maybe lessons for investors and also just what I think. But the lessons for investors, I think, is part of the reason why I thought he had a better chance of winning, candidly, is that I watched the speech, a full speech, his speech announcing his candidacy. And I, I think that's important um, because we deal in information all the time. And that, um, the, the important thing is to get the information firsthand as opposed to getting it through some sort of other filter. And I watched the speech and I'm saying, boy, I don't know. This is going to be... Uh, this is going to be very compelling for a lot of people, uh, especially in a world in which you have low returns, uh, low growth, middle class is hurting. And one of the things I think um, is that this is part of a broader phenomenon globally, which is really a backlash against intellectual orthodoxy and political elites. And it's, it's the intellectual orthodoxy, frankly, from both the right and the left, and so when I think about the United States, I would say, you know, average people are just questioning now whether the PhDs, in most cases they're PhDs, um, all the things they're telling them that have been good for them are good for them, right? And so from the right, that would be nation building, or it might be free trade under any circumstances. Uh, from the left, it might be the Affordable Care Act, or it might be open borders, right? If you look at finance, uh, it might be the Yale model of endowments. There's all these things, again, that have been supported by a lot of academic, uh, you know, a, you know very, supposedly very strong academic research where people are saying, gee, you know, if I'm an average person, I'm saying, gee, I'm not so sure this is so great for me. And I think that's part of the reason why Trump is doing so well. I think that's part of the reason why Brexit happened. Uh, Italy has a, uh, a referendum on December 4th. And I'm not making a value judgment on whether that's the right reaction or not reaction, but that is clearly the reaction that people are having, that people have felt like they've been lied to by a, a political class. And, and they, they really are in a mood to just say, listen, you know, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, we just want to make a change. So that was my, um, that was my general feeling. And um, I still think that's going to be very powerful. Uh, I have to say, uh, whether, whether uh, Donald Trump wins or loses on November 8th, I think Trumpism or populism is very much here to stay and will be, I, I don't think that some of those populist ideas will be vanquished regardless of what the, uh, what the election outcome is.